And today I want to talk a little bit about energized prayer and how God can give us the energy and the strength. What happens in our prayer closet and and what we can uh, see accomplished in our personal walk with God when we submit to him in prayer. So I want to pick up in James chapter 5, starting in verse 12. And it says, but above all, brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. Now, this is the brother of Jesus, if you didn't know. This is James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, He was one of the church leaders in, in Jerusalem. He was actually the one that... Paul approached when he first came into into Jerusalem to meet the church elders, uh, and there was a squabble about the fact that Paul felt like he was called to reach out to the Gentiles, to those who weren't Jews. Now, James, uh, the brother of Jesus, was just so compelled to reach out with the love of Christ that he embraced Paul, even in the middle of all this argument that was happening in the church. Can I tell you, squabbles happen in the church all the time. That does not mean that the church is in trouble. Just because you don't agree with your brother and sister does not mean that the church is failing and is going to go down the tubes. It doesn't mean that, it's, it, that God doesn't exist. It just means that we're human. Every one of us is human. We all fail. We all falter. We all have differing opinions. However, here he writes this letter to the Jews all that was spread out throughout the nations. And if you read chapter 1, and we'll probably do a study on the book of James. I love the book of James. Uh, probably in the new year, we'll, we'll start that in the new year, a study on the book of James. But as he opens up this letter, the Spirit of God just em- empowers him, and he writes this. He says, he goes to the, to the ones who were dispersed, to the ones who were, who were sent out. And uh, it, it wasn't necessarily a connotation, a negative connotation that, you know, that there was persecution and everybody had to flee. The word that he actually uses in the Greek is one in which they actually were spread out for a purpose, that they would disperse for a purpose. Now, in the middle of all the bad things that happened to us, can I tell you, God has a purpose in that as well. Absolutely. So James gives this encouragement to the people, uh, to these the Jews in particular, but then to also the Gentile, to the church in particular. And he says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And then he starts to talk, the broach, this particular area of praying. Is anyone among you suffering? He says, let them pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let them sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, just like we did just a moment ago, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if, is, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. In verse 16, he says, Confess your trespasses one to another, and pray for one another that you may be healed, for the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sin. So here he kind of broaches this idea, this concept of prayer. When we talk about prayer, this is kind of one of those elemental things that we as believers should know when we first get saved. What is prayer? What is it? What does that mean? I mean, we talked a couple of months ago, we went through a series on the Bible and knowing the Bible and, and reading the Bible and knowing the Word of God and letting the Word of God. So then what is prayer then? Why is this so elemental? Why is, so, why is this so needed in a, in a believer's life and somebody who gives their life to Jesus? Well, well, we know that in its most basic element, prayer is a conversation with God. Uh, it is one of communicating, not just talking to him, but also hearing from him. It's not just us giving a bunch of flowery words or, or taking something that somebody uh, wrote on a piece of paper and then reciting it for ourselves, but it is an actual conversation with God in its most basic element. 
that, there's so much to prayer, and we're going to encompass that over the next uh, few weeks, and I hope that we can cover a lot of that. But there's so much to prayer that uh, sometimes we, 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 we've got to start with what it, prayer is not. What prayer is not. But before I go into that, I want to I want to give you a couple of things of American culture, what we view as prayer. So here, uh, Religion News put this out. When Americans aren't busy praying for themselves or their own needs, and most of them are, many are seeking divine intervention on behalf of a favorite sports team or the golden ticket in the lottery, right? <laughs> that's That's what we see. So then what are, what are the other things that people pray for in American culture? About 13% of Americans who pray say they pray for sports team compared with about one in five who say they pray for the lottery. So here, a survey done by, by uh, the public, research, uh, public religion research shows this. It shows that 82% of, family, of people in America pray for family or friends. 74% of them pray for their own problems and difficulties. 54% pray for good things that have recently occurred. Uh, 42% pray for their own sin. 38% of people pray, uh, people in natural disasters pray. 37% pray for God's greatness. Uh, 36% pray my future prosperity. Uh, 20% people of other faiths or no faith pray at all. Uh, 12% of gov- uh, pray for government leaders. 5% pray for celebrities, and 2% don't pray. They just don't pray. Some of LifeWay's surveys also show this. It says 48% of Americans pray every day. 82% who pray typically pray about family or friends. We saw that. A smaller number, around 5%, pray for someone's relationship to end. Hmm. In the New Testament, Paul encourages Christians to pray for those in authority. However, look at this next research. Uh, about 12% of Americans pray for those who, pray, uh, who are in government. And hear what Americans have prayed for in the past. 41%. Go to the next slide. 41% pray for, pray for people who mistreated them. 37% pray for their enemies. Like I said, 21% prayed for winning the lottery. 20% prayed for success in something that they put absolutely no effort into. <laughs> Let that one sink in. <laughs> 15%, no one to find out a bad thing had been done. 14%, God to avenge someone who hurt them or a loved one. prayed for their favorite sports team. 9% bad things that happened to a bad person. I hope nobody's here because they prayed for the Cubs. Last (laughs) bottom of the ninth. (laughs) 5% success in something that you knew wouldn't please God. 5% for someone's relationship to end. 5% someone to get fired. 4% for someone else to fail. So we see that up there and we see... We, we know what Americans pray for. So what should we, what is prayer not then? What, what is it that we should be when we pray? What is it that we should be concerned about? And what are the, some of the things that we should not be concerned about? Well, prayer is not some mystical process whereby we call out to some force out there. It's not a mystical process, nor is it any kind of power with which we create things or speak them into existence. Ordering God around like a bellhop. Hmm. Prayer is communicating with and hearing God. Prayer is not an attempt to harness God's power for our own purpose so that we give us, so that He can give us what we want. So that's called egocentric prayer. And it's centered around us. We, we ought not pray for ourselves or, or, or for God to do something for us in particular, that we would advance or that it would be about our own selfish nature. Now, does that prohibit us from praying about things that we go through? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, if we read the verses that we just read, we understand that there are needs that we need to be prayed for. And we need prayer 
And only God can supply those needs. And so throughout Scripture, we see people who would humble themselves. And that's the key component in prayer is that we humble ourselves to know that God is in control. I want to tell you that I'm scared about some of the things that are happening in some, in, uh, among some teachers, Bible teachers, where they tell us to declare and proclaim or to uh, name it and claim it. Uh, can I tell you that's dangerous ground when we start declaring certain things for our own self. God has never, nowhere in Scripture do we see that God commissions us to declare something for ourselves. Instead, we declare his name to be exalted in all things so that his will, not my will, God, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. So prayer is this act of humbling ourselves and coming before God. Not not groveling before God, but humbling ourselves and coming to him in, in, in humility and bringing our needs before him, trusting that he is the one who supplies all of our needs. And so that's what, when we talk about prayer, that's what we're talking about. He says in verse 16, Confess our trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. He reminds us that we're to pray for one another so that whatever it is that we're going through, that God can intervene in that circumstance. That word that's used there for healed is not just physical healing, but it is an emotional and spiritual healing as well. That God would intervene in our circumstances is that we would be made whole so that God would bring his wholeness in, in, um, evident in our own lives. It's a, he says, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Well, that word effective, effectual, and fervent is actually one word in the Greek. Did you know that? Well, we, we have two words for it in English. But in the Greek, it's just a one word, and it's energeo. That word is where we get the word energy. Uh, the word is used 21 times in the New Testament. It's a verb, which means that it's active, that it is moving. It, it means that we're, we're energized, you and I, uh, when we pray, that we're given energy. Our prayers are meant to affect change. Our prayers are not meant to just be words whispered in the wind. Our words, the prayers that you and I pray should be affecting change in not just our lives, but in the lives of others, those that we pray and intercede on behalf. And so this is why we are called then as believers to pray. Because we're called then to make change in the area of influence that you and I have. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, was doing all the right things in the Old Testament in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1 through 30. But suddenly, without warning, he received a frightening report. A vast army was coming on you, is coming on you, is the, is the alarm that came to Jehoshaphat's court. And so this is what he did. He stops and he prays this, uh, verse 12 of uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. He says, Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are upon you. I don't know what to do, God, but I will fix my gaze on you. I trust you. I hope in you. I rest in you. As Jehoshaphat prayed, so did the people of Judah. And in their response to God in verse 13, he says, All Judah with their little ones, their wives and their children stood before the Lord. That means that they prayed. They got before God's presence and they humbled themselves. Since Jehoshaphat chose to turn the problem over to God, God responded powerfully and he answered the prayer of the king and his people. See, God God hears our prayers. When we pray, we're not just whispering words into the wind. We are literally touching the heart of God. He is hearing our petitions and our pleas 
before him. He is, he hears you. He understands you. I had, uh, just a, a few years ago, there was a young man, uh, who came to this church actually when we first, when it was the first year we were here. It was a young man who had just given his life to the Lord. I'm telling you, he had never been exposed to the gospel, never had heard the message of Jesus. There was no family member that ever had reached out to him. Uh, he had just, he had gone through the police academy. He had kind of met some Christians and he thought they were kind of weird, uh, kind of different, but he never, nobody actually ever shared the message of Jesus. So I got to spend some time with him and, and, I, and I shared the basics and he gave his life to the Lord. As he struggled through some of that, he said, Pastor, I, I don't, I feel like I shouldn't be praying about my own problem. It seems selfish. And I looked at him and I said, brother, you got the right heart. You've got the right heart. We don't want to be selfish in our prayers, but I will tell you that when you have an issue, bring it before the Lord. Bring it before God. You, prayer is you having that conversation with God. To, um, to let him know, this is my struggle, God. And it's not that I just want my own thing. It's that I need freedom so that I can live in you. And man, that just like completely opened his eyes up to the fullness of God. And his life was different. That doesn't mean that everything was copacetic. There were still things that needed to be, actions that needed to be taken. He still needs to take actions. You and I still need to take active steps once we bring it before God, so that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth. What does that mean? That energy, that means that our prayers need to be so energized that it moves us and it stirs us to do something, not just to say words. Our prayers have to stir us into action. And if we're not moving from words to action, then we've lost something along the way. And that's why he goes on to say this in in verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours. What nature is that? The sinful nature, the one that says, hmm, I left it. I took it to God. Yeah, I said, God, forgive me. And I'm still struggling with this. So maybe God just wants me to have, maybe this is just like that thorn in my flesh that Paul talks about. You know, we all like to justify our sins, don't we? Yeah, well, Paul had a thorn in his flesh, so maybe, maybe it's okay for me to have this thorn in my flesh. And he says this, he says, look at the example of Elijah, who was a man with a nature just like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain in the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the, and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced. Okay, so what, is, what does that have to do with you and I? This is what took place in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18. So Elijah comes to the mount, and he's standing at the mount, and once again he's dealing with these absolutely hard-headed kings. This king and queen that just, they were always, always trying him. And so he... He proclaims that there's going to be drought in the land for three and a half years. All right? That's all and good. But then what does he do? He fears for his life and he runs. He cut tails and runs. He goes and he hides. Just like you and I. Hey, man, I, all's good in my faith until I, get, until I get to that point of trial when somebody really tests me. And, or, or some infirmity, some sickness, some financial crisis. It's trying me, God. I don't know. I'm at that place. Well, we're all just like Elijah. We all have that sinful nature that causes us to question, is God really hearing me? My family thinks I'm crazy. They think I've lost it. Now I'm talking about this Jesus guy. What does that have to do? Uh, they're looking at me like I've lost my mind. The fervency of my, of my, my stance for Christ. And they're sitting here saying, can't you just tone it down a little bit? You know, why does it always got to be about Jesus? And we come up to those times and obstacles in our life and we do exactly what Elijah does. He runs. But listen, what happens? God reminds him about that in, first, in chapter 18, and he's once again standing before the king and the queen, and once again he proclaims that God will bring 
reign. He proclaims it. He believes it. Even though there was a period of three and a half years where nothing happened, he still called out to God and rain fell. Are you going through some dry spells in your life? Now the decision is yours. How are you going to act? What are you going to do? Because he says that the effective, fervent prayer, the energized prayer of a righteous man does avail much. What does that mean? That it works much. It is not just, it is not just a, a conduit in which energy can pass, but it's actually the end product. It's energized. It's full of energy, and it produces something. It produces something. Paul exhorts us that supplications, prayers, in 1 uh, Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. In all godliness and reverence, so that when we pray, that we can leave, live peaceably. What does that word peaceably mean? It doesn't mean necessarily that there's not going to be any problems. That it means, it means that even in the middle of problems, you can have peace. He says, so when we pray, whether it's in supplications, whether it's in giving thanks, whether it's in exhortation, however it is that we pray before God, however it is that we humble ourselves before God, that we can have peace despite what we're going through. And that our prayers then be not just on ourselves, but who on who? On our leaders, on those in influence in our life, or our, our bosses and our wives and our husbands, that I can learn to then lead this quiet and peaceable life so that godliness and reverence are what becomes the thing that separates me from everyone else. There's a lot of people who don't believe in Jesus who pray, but their prayers are ineffective. It doesn't change who they are. There are many people who go to church and pray, but their prayers are ineffective and it doesn't change their life. It doesn't lead to godliness and holiness and reverence. It doesn't change who they are. So God desires that you and I then activate a prayer life that brings us to a place of righteousness. So that's why he says that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Because God wants change to take place in your life and in mine. So that we can then produce change. So that we can produce not you and I in the essence of that we're producing change, but that change takes place through our prayer. So that it's not just me declaring and decreeing something. Somebody prays that, prays that. It, it makes me cringe. It makes me wonder, who are you? Who do you think you are to decree and declare something? But that I can come before him and say, God, not my will, but yours be done. To him who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. And to him who has eyes, let him see what the Spirit is doing. See, those are the prayers that I value is when we put God first rather than our own wants and our own selfish needs before God. That we say, God, here is your, your will be done. You lead me in, into the paths of righteousness. You open my eyes so that I may see. Don't let it be about me. It's not about my will. It's not about what I want. It's about what you want. Let my yes be yes and my no be no, because I know his yeses and his noes. And so when I pray, let me pray about those who are in need. Let me pray about my leaders. Let me pray about this election. That God, you would change the heart of the person that comes into office. Because whether we get a Republican or whether we get a Democrat, we're going to get somebody who is human and flawed and has their own agenda. And so when we pray, may we pray that His will be done. Not our own, His will. Let me close with this. Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. This is Paul, and he writes about Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ. 
who was greeting them, and he says he's always fervently laboring in prayer. I mean, it takes it out of him when he prays for you. I want to ask you, when was the last time you prayed so intently that it took everything out of you? When was the last time you prayed over your children so intense and you labored over your prayer over them as you, as you cried out to God? And you've heard me say this the moment that, that my son and both my son and my daughter were born. I took the word of God and I, I, I opened it up to the book of Deuteronomy. I cried out to God. I said, Lord, as your word says, let them be the head and not the tail. Father, I I trust that your will would be done in their lives, that you would lift them up and that you would never, you would never let them fall or falter in your ways. See, there's a difference between declaring what I want and declaring what God wants. And when we declare with what God wants, it is labor. It is labor intensive. It takes everything out of you because it's not you. It's not what you want. It's what God wants. When Hannah presented her son Samuel before the Lord, listen, it says that she prayed so hard, she was uttering words that were just incoherent. Nobody understood what she was saying. It was a labor of prayer and love and devotion for the future of her child. So he says this, he says, Epaphras labors fervently for you in prayers so that, that you may stand perfect and complete in what? So that you don't just stand perfect and complete. Listen, I would love for people to pray for me that I would stand perfect and complete. There are some days that I kind of have that strut to my step. Hey, everything's going perfect and complete today. Man, man, my wife really prayed for me today. (laughs) It's not that we just kind of get cocky about it. He says, but listen, so that we would stand perfect and complete in what? In the will of God. Let's pray that we can stand as a body of Christ, as a body of believers for our children, for our spouses, for our homes, for our family members, our extended family members, those who we really don't want to claim as family, but they are family members. (laughs) And we stand in the gap for our community, for our neighbors, for our bosses, for those that God would have placed in our midst, and that we would pray that God's will would be done, that his perfect and complete will. And that, my friend, is not an easy task. That's just not one prayer and forget it and get it done and move on. That's a consistent prayer. Because the moment we have attained God's will in our lives, we've just started on the great path that God has for us. So we must continually pray, God, not my will, but yours be done. And it's a labor of love that we pray that. Here, you for me, me for you, you for your neighbor, and your neighbor for you that we can pray that prayer and believe it and trust it and trust God to have his will be done in our lives. With every eye closed and every head bowed. Heavenly Father, I pray today that your will would be done in our lives, that our prayers would be energized, that it would prompt us to do something, not just to stay stagnant, not just to pray like 20% of our nation. They pray for something that they put no effort into. God, that as we pray, that it stirs us into action. That our prayers truly are that effectual, fervent prayer of the man who stands right before God or the woman who stands right before God. That we would hear your voice and know your will and walk in your will. Father, how do we know your will? pray that you would reveal that to each one of us. Let us not be persuaded by the teachings of the day, the gurus that are out there. But Father, let us hear your voice as we plainly seek your word 
and apply it in our lives. And as we pray one for another, may we hear your voice diligently prodding us and moving us to do what you have us to do. Maybe there's somebody here today and you're saying, Pastor, my life isn't where it needs to be. And when it comes to the issue of prayer, I've neglected that aspect of my spiritual walk. I haven't activated it just like what you've been talking about. It it doesn't energize me. It's just whenever I'm in trouble, I cry out to God. Or maybe when I'm hurting, I, 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 I ask somebody to pray with me. But I, my prayer life is not where it needs to be. And I need God to show me and reveal that to me today. What do I need to do? How do I need to act out? What steps do I need to take to pray more fervently? To pray more effectually? Is that you this morning? I want to keep you in prayer. I want to, if we can, maybe this week sit down. Let's talk about this and find some strategies that we can use to walk more effectively for Him. Father, I thank You today. I thank You for Your people who seek You and seek Your purpose in their life. For those who are struggling today, Father, may You give them the strength to be more than overcomers through the blood of the Lamb and through the words of their testimony. Minister to their hearts today.